Hello, welcome to the Friday, September 3rd, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quick reminder from Xavier today that uh, after big natural disasters like Hurricane Ida this week, we often do see related fraud and malware. Actually, the first time we really sort of saw this on a massive scale was Hurricane Katrina, which just happened about 18 years ago, I believe. So if you see anything, let us know. We did see a slight uptick in domain registrations related uh, to the hurricane, but really nothing at the scale we saw before. On the other hand, of course, a lot of uh, these domains are these days registered way in advance of uh, the event. And last week I mentioned a vulnerability in Atlassian's uh, Confluence product uh, that uh, was uh, patched. Well, it turns out this vulnerability is already being exploited. Uh, details were published and Rapid7 is now reporting that they're seeing active attempts to exploit Confluence server using this vulnerability. So better make sure that you are all patched. And GitHub continues its effort to make Git more secure. If you're connecting to GitHub after removing essentially access with passwords, they're now also clamping down on what key types and what ciphers you're using. For the most part, this may not even be noticeable if you're using a modern client. As far as the keys go, your keys should still work for now. In January, you will no longer be able to add new keys that don't match the more modern requirements and then March stuff may stop working. So double check that you're, for example, not using any DSA keys in order uh, to connect uh, to a GitHub. And we got a critical patch from Cisco for Cisco Enterprise NFVIS. Uh, this is sort of a Linux uh, system that allows you uh, to deploy virtualized network functions and authentication apparently can be bypassed if you have attack ACS enabled. Uh, so either make sure you don't have that enabled or make sure you apply the patch that's now available. No exploit available for this vulnerability as far as I know. And it has been talked about uh, years and years ago. For example, Arrigo Triolsi back in the day talked about hiding malware in network cards and of course in GPUs. Well, it looks like these somewhat theoretical exploits at the time are now slowly migrating into the mainstream with attackers selling software in forums that uh, does apparently hide in the GPU. GPU, of course, has great computing capacities and pretty straightforward to hide some malicious software inside a GPU. Well, it's Friday again, and uh, as so often Friday, we do have a sans.edu student with us to talk about a recent research paper. With me here is uh, Michael Beck. Uh, Michael, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? My name is Michael Beck. I am a father first, husband, and also a security researcher and forensicator. I've been doing this about 20 some odd years currently working for Deloitte. What else do you need to know about me? Uh, your paper was all about the cloud. And of course, can you explain a little bit what the paper was about and what some of the challenges were that you uh, investigated there? Sure, no problem. So th the paper is, is actually about leveraging the cloud to conduct collections and uh, uh, triage and processing of digital media. The digital media can be in any format. It can be cloud digital media, it can be laptops or mobile devices, but the, the gist of the paper is to leverage the cloud resources to reduce that mean time to analysis, to get the information in front of the uh, forensicator as quickly as possible. So traditionally, as a forensicator, you would have like this massive workstation, typically with tons of slots of disks, uh, what are some of the disadvantages of that setup that you try to alleviate by moving some of this into the cloud? So moving into the cloud, we alleviated the bottleneck of a single collection point on those 
um, lovingly called friends. Um, they're very good at doing what they need to do as far as processing, but they have a, a limitation when it comes to collection. Um, we They typically can only collect one asset at a time. Uh, using this framework, we're able to collect unlimited number of assets in parallel. So basically, we're, we're just taking the scale of cloud processing and applying that to collections. You're really solving kind of two problems here. One is the limited capabilities of these threads that, uh, yes, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars, but it's probably still not big enough for uh, everything you need to do. And uh, secondly, also, of course, a lot of the data that you're already collecting is already in the cloud anyway. So you're kind of moving that thread, in some cases at least, closer to the source of the data. That is correct as well. Uh, we have noticed that with a lot of our, our current work and a lot of our, our current casework, especially when it comes to crypto jacking, it's, the investigations are in the cloud. So it's always nice to be able to process as close to that source or collect and process as close to that source as possible. So for those types of cases, this framework allows us to, to let's, for instance, say the, the, the cases in Google, in the Google Cloud Platform, we can build this framework in a GCP instance or GCP org and apply it to the, the suspect and all the witness data or the witness machines in that environment. We don't have to bring it down and then process it or move it to a different cloud and process it. Uh, with this framework, we can very quickly just set it up in that cloud service provider and have it ready for us uh, in a very short order. Now, when I started reading your paper, uh, one of the first things that I was sort of a little bit concerned about is the good old saying, well, the cloud is just someone else's computer. Uh, when you're doing forensics investigation, particularly if there is some uh, criminal legal issues or uh, even civil legal issues involved. Uh, preserving the integrity of the evidence and such is always uh, a big concern. How do you ensure the integrity of the investigation if you no longer control the hardware that you're using to do the investigation with? So that's a great question. We, we have to, one, have a trust relationship with the cloud service providers, that they're going to keep our data isolated to only our control, as well as uh, when we do the collection process, we built in the, the, the hashing of that data. So we're maintaining best evidence for any, any uh, discovery or prosecution, if it may come. Uh, when cases do lead to the need to preserve, we also have the ability to bring that data back down to a local repository as needed or, or by, by, by legal order or demand. And then we can, you know, since we've built in the, the validation of that best evidence, once we bring it down to a local repository, we validate it again, we preserve that chain of custody, and there's, there's, there's nothing really to be concerned about. Yeah, and basically that's, I guess, best practice for any mm -hmm. forensic investigation that you create your hashes as soon as possible as you acquire the data. So, and so far, it's not really all that different, or? Not really that different. We're just, we're just leveraging the power of the cloud. Yeah. You know, traditionally, that's all been done in, in a serial fashion. You collect, you, you hash, you triage, hash, uh, process, validate. And it's done in serial. We've all tried to use a, a FRED system to do multiple cases in parallel. Um, and that really doesn't work all the time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, things crash. Uh, when, when you try to take multiple um, uh, processing tools, say uh, Axiom Cyber or NCASE and run them in parallel, things don't always work right. When we run these in the cloud, every, every instance that we run is isolated to itself. And then we can run as many of those as we want that are equal to the number of suspect or, or, or target systems that we're acquiring, processing, and triaging. That way, there's no risk of cross-contamination, and there's no risk of delay in getting that data to the analyst for, their, for them to use. 
And I guess, you know, the focus of your paper is also a little bit the triage aspect, or that's sort of mm -hmm. in the early stages of an investigation when you aren't even sure yet uh, do you have a case. Or, so in, in this case, it really speeds up uh, that initial selection. What do I have Absolutely. to spend more time on? What do I have to spend less time on? I guess you could at that point always then decide to pull it down into a local system if you think it's more appropriate for a particular case. And that's true as well, but we've we've also learned that some of our forensic platforms, uh, Axiom in particular, run more efficiently in the cloud. So what we've done is we've built uh, a, a an instance in the cloud that emulates a Fred, but we're not having to spend that money on the Fred. We can actually just run that high powered forensic workstation in the cloud, and we actually get better performance. So we're, we're, we're twofold. We're reducing the time it takes to process a, a piece of evidence, and we're reducing the total cost of operations because we're not having to outlay that, that capital cost to purchase the FREDs. It's only running the, the cloud instance as we need it. Yeah, and that's, of course, always sort of one of the big advantages of uh, running things in the cloud. Now, mm -hmm. at this point, you're only essentially running virtual machines in the cloud, or you're sort of doing a one-to-one -one copy of what you would have on your desk, under your desk, and you're moving that into the cloud. That's correct. Uh, what about using some of the more cloud-native tools, like you know, running your databases, for example, uh, using one that the cloud provider offers sort of as a, as a service? Uh, have you thought about that? Uh, would that work, or are the tools too specialized for that? So we, we've thought about that, and we're thinking about that as next steps. Um, one of the things we really want to get into is using some of the containerized uh, uh, and, and Lambda functions specifically of AWS. I don't really want to call out AWS so much because I think this is applicable to Azure, GCP, and AWS. But using some of their automation functions to make this <laughs> more faster. I know that's not a good word to use. Yep. <laughs> but the ultimate goal is to get the end user or or the, the, the operations back to normal. That's the ultimate goal is for, for a business is to get, their, to get their organization or their operational unit back to uh, being productive. We don't want to delay at all that, that, that productivity. So what we were looking at doing is actually using some of the, uh, the in AWS, the Lambda and the, and the Docker containers to automate this whole process from identification through uh, processing. So that's a little bit sort of the orchestration part of the firm where you're really more worried about incident response, recovery, not necessarily so much about the legal aspects of forensics. That's correct, yes. You wrote this research paper. What's next for you with uh, SANS.edu? Um, almost done with your degree or uh, any more class you need to take? Uh, one year left. Uh, recently just kicked off the, the project management course, which is uh, uh, really exciting. Um, it's, a, it's a definite change of pace from the, the technical courses, but I'm actually kind of excited about it, um, as well as the 24-hour uh, the practicum uh, with the team. So got to meet the team yesterday, um, having lunch with them today, and uh, really getting excited to kicking off that 24-hour exercise. Well, thanks, Michael, for joining me here. And don't think I ever heard anybody call project management exciting, but must be a great class. That's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again after the Labor Day holiday on Tuesday. Bye.